without any further ado, and it looks like everybody has is, uh, is, uh, pretty much identified themselves as to who they are and uh, uh, has been muted. So I'm going to just do a quick intro on Anthony here, who many of you have seen before in our couple of earlier presentations. But Anthony, we're going to let you, um, I'll, I'll let you uh, give them the ones that don't know you a little rundown about yourself. And uh, Anthony's going to talk to us tonight about SDR radios, which we we're learning a bit about, but I want to learn more about. And we're planning on on uh, doing some of that at the club, especially after last weekend. Uh, Anthony, you go ahead and take it away. I'm going to mute myself. Okay, thanks, Pi. Well, my name is Anthony Lasgri, uh, Kilo Eight Zulu Tango. Uh, this next month, or sometime around that, I'm not sure exactly. I don't remember exactly the month. I will have my 40th anniversary in amateur radio. I know it was this summer, but I don't remember the exact month. I just know it was hot when I took the test in the library, and uh, I remember getting the, the 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 license in the mail a couple months later. Um, I love to operate. That's my favorite part of amateur radio. Uh, I'm approaching 100,000 QSOs this summer for my uh, 40 years. Uh, about 38 years on HF. The first two years I was in an apartment where I couldn't do any HF for the most part. Uh, my wife, Linda, KE8ODP, is also a ham, but not very active anymore. She was much more active in the olden days. And uh, I like to play, uh, play around with QRP, so I'm one of those gluttons for punishment. Uh, those 100,000 QSOs, about 99% of them are 5 watts or less. So the presentation tonight actually grew out of one of my other areas of pursuit. I'm the section youth coordinator for Ohio, and I originally developed uh, a a three page three page handout for the students I was working with on using uh, software defined radios because when I would go to a school and work with them I'd sometimes have 50 to 75 kids so I, it was hard to work individually with them so I had um, some projects they could do off on the side and tuning in the software design defined radios was one of them so I put in the chat two links one for the uh, presentation tonight and one is for the little handout the free uh, RX is the one with the handout and those will be available to you afterward. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So this is my uh, grandson slumping into a chair and you notice he has the software defined radio installed on his phone, one of the online uh, viewers. So he's using that on his phone. That's one of the nice things about these radios. Now uh, this is my email contact information and my website. And again, the link to the web to the presentation tonight is tiny.cc slash OSDR, Online Software Defined Radios. Um, many years ago, before I was a ham, my grandmother had this portable Zenith radio. You know, you can tell it's portable because it has a handle on it, even though it weighs about 20 pounds, probably. It had a handle on it, and uh, it intrigued me as a child because it had all these little buttons and knobs on in the front of it. So I turned it on. And I found out that there was an antenna that you could extend. You can see it in the back here. And there were a few stations, but not very strong. Um, I didn't think it worked very well. Probably because I was tuning the wrong bands at the time, because I didn't understand where to tune. And also that antenna wasn't that great. Uh, so fast forward 50 years, and you can pick up a radio that does everything that radio did, and it fits in the palm of your hand and it's not very expensive. The only problem is it still requires you to have a good outside antenna if you really want to receive a lot of stuff. And most of these radios do not include single sideband, so they're not that useful for listening to hams. So what do you do when you just can't put up an antenna, you don't own an HF receiver, or maybe you're traveling and just want to tap into ham, it's your ra ham radio. If you have internet access, you can get on and listen to online software defined tunable receivers. Um, you could, in fact, do both uh, receive and transmit with a remote connection, but we're not going to talk about remote transmit, transceivers tonight. We're just going to talk about remote receivers. So that's another project for another time. Actually, I think your club might have had a presentation on that not too long ago. So the definition from Wikipedia is SDR, Software Defined Radio, is a radio communication system where components traditionally implemented in hardware, e.g. mixers, filters, amplifiers, modulars, modulators, demodulators, detectors, etc., are instead implemented by a means of software on a personal computer or an embedded computing system. So there's full, full transceivers out there. 
Some of them don't have any onboard controls and you need a computer to operate them, uh, such as the Flex 1500, their first model, the little QRP thing that came out first, and then up to the ones that they have now. There was also something called the Hobby PC uh, that was a 5 watt uh, HF uh, SDR transceiver. Both of these required a computer. Uh, some of the so what are called software defined receivers are or transceivers are actually have controls on them they look r rather like a, a traditional radio so the icom 7300 looks everything like a traditional radio but it has a lot of software defined radio characteristics and actually most of the radios are moving to some component of them being software defined so that it blurs it gets very blurry now there are a whole group of sdr receivers out there uh, that are dongles that just plug into your usb drive uh, a lot of them are vhf uhf only very inexpensive a lot of them are designed originally to be able to receive over the air television signals and special services in different countries that we don't even have in the u.s but they worked well on vhf and uhf uh, rtl sdrs are one of them and the earlier and cheaper versions were VF, uh, VHF, UHF only, but some of the later versions have HF capability, or you can add an HF converter and use these. Uh, they range from uh, a couple dollars, under $5, to $30, depending on the model you're looking at. The next level up are these kit and small modules with HF uh, compatibility built into them, and they're very good receivers, such as the Air Spy, the Kiwi BBG, and the SDR player, which has a variety of different models. This is a illustration here of a Kiwi. And the Kiwi is a combination of a Beagle board, microprocessor, and the, the radio components. The thing I'm going to talk about first is online SDRs. So they're basically these things at someone else's house with someone else's antenna and someone else's internet connection that we can tap into with our internet connection and nothing else. So there's hundreds and th probably thousands of these available online to use on the internet. Most use a web browser based software. Uh, the interface isn't cons is, is somewhat consistent, but they do vary a little bit. So they, they do take a little bit of getting used to. Most of them don't require any additional software, which makes them great to use with kids or to use with your phone or other things. Some of them, such as the AirSpy, require a user to run a local software client on their own computer to be able to access them. I put together a list of four uh, main resources. I'm going to be concentrating mostly tonight on the web SDR and the Kiwi SDR, but the other ones are also out there for use. I'm not going to demonstrate the Air Spies tonight. I'm going to just look at the first three in the demos. And this is actually when you click on the links. Anytime you see this little link thing, that means if you click on it, it will take you out to that link. And here's the web SDR list, and I think there's like 70 or 75 entries, and some of these actually support multiple receivers so there's over a hundred receivers out there on the web SDR alone now what can you use an OSDR for well of course you can use it just to listen but there's other purposes too you can use it as a supplemental remote receiver let's say you live in an area with a high noise level using a remote receiver away from your house might be a way to get around that high noise level especially on the low bands of 160 and 80 meters I use it as a youth recruitment tool. It's something I can give a kid immediately and they can start using without having to worry about putting up an antenna outside their house. By the way, when I built my first uh, shortwave receiver back in junior high, the only place I was allowed to put an antenna up was, in my, was near my bedroom. My bedroom happened to be in the basement, so I just stapled it to the floor joist and my antenna was a couple feet below the surface of the ground, but it still worked. Um, you can also use them to bypass geographic or propagation limitations. If the band's not open to a specific area at the time you want to listen, uh, you can always choose a receiver that's in a location that can receive that area. You can also use it to bypass the antenna restrictions or equipment limitations. Let's say you don't have a HF receiver at the time that, and you want to receive HF, or you don't have a 160 antenna and you want to listen to what 160 sounds like. It's a great way, especially for newer club members who might not have any HF equipment at all. It's a great way to get them started listening. So um, we're going to talk first about HF SDRs for the most part. Uh, listening on HF bands to hear other signals if you don't have a receiver antenna, of course. So you can listen to amateur radio, you can listen to short wave, and you can listen to medium wave commercial AM broadcast stations. And I'll talk about this a couple times because there's a couple reasons you might want to listen to AM stations that aren't near you. 
You also can listen to a remotely located SDR to hear your own transmitted signal to judge the quality of your signal and or the propagation. So I could bring up a receiver anywhere around the world and see how strong and how good my signal sounds there uh, any time of the day without having to worry about someone else being on the other side to listen. You can also, um, as I mentioned, listen to an SDR while using your station's transmitter. So this would allow you to complete a two-way contact when you have high noise in your area or maybe just having difficulty receiving the other station. It's also good for A-B testing of multiple antennas. So if I have three antennas and I want to try them out immediately and I don't want to tie someone else up, I can tune in a station that can hear, that can hear my signal and I can test to my heart's content. Um, I can also do antenna pattern mapping. I can choose different stations that are at different uh, azimuth locations from my uh, house and different distances, and I can actually map out where my antennas are working best to. You can also use it for assessing propagation conditions. Or you can just use it to listen. It's a great way to provide a radio to youth or other people that want to listen. And as I mentioned earlier, I put together this handout called Free FRX. And it's basically designed for the hand to someone who maybe doesn't even have much basic radio information. And uh, they can go through this and it tells a little bit about the links. It gives them a screenshot of, we zoom in a little bit here. It gives them a screenshot to uh, know how to tune up the radio for one of the examples here with the web SDR. It shows them the frequencies they might want to listen to for hams, uh, how to set the filters, um, what mode to choose. Also has some keyboard shortcuts available. And then have a same, something similar for the Kiwi radios, uh, some additional places they can listen. Uh, I'll talk about some of these a little bit later. A little bit of information on shortwave listening if they've never done it before. Uh, some band and frequency charts. Uh, even some DX uh, uh, clusters so they can hear see stations that are spotted and then look for those specific stations on specific frequencies. A section on Morse code and digital. And then uh, the amateur bands, including notes on when, when, what the band is good for and whether it's a night or daytime band. I remember as a novice, I spent a lot of time calling CQ on 10 meters in the middle of the night and uh, listening on 80 during the day and not hearing anyone except for my next door neighbor. So uh, it's nice to be able to know those when you don't know about radio propagation. So again, that's available at FreeRx. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in schools, they work well with Chromebooks also, which a lot of schools are using. Uh, you can also use them to decode uh, FT8 and FT4. Some, there's also some CW decoders you can feed. You can feed a RIDI decoder. You could even feed the audio from these radios into a uh, slow scan television decoder. So anything that any software that you have that you can decode a signal with that you might not be able to decode by ear or it's not possible to decode by ear, uh, you have that possibility to do it. And I have some links here. Uh, G4 um, Z Fox Quebec has some information on piping the sound between the SDRs and the decoders. I also have a presentation, which I think I did for your club on, uh, on uh, digital modes and one on Morse code. The Kiwi web uh, interface has a built-in whisper decoder that you can use. Now, as far as VHF SDRs, um, they're a great way for hams or new club members to be able to tune into your local club's weekly VHF UHF net. So if your group has a net on the local repeater and they don't have a VHF radio, that's a great way to do it. Or uh, it's also a chance to tune in some of the, the VHF signals uh, bands that you may not have equipment for if you want to see what 220 activity is like in your area. It's also a great way to test antennas. You can do the antenna substitution test and test them out by listening to a remote VHF radio. You can also use the VHF SDRs to listen to weather stations, aircraft, trains, uh, public service utilities, commercial FM broadcast. And along with the medium wave AM uh, SDRs, they're a great way to listen to local sports. So if you happen to be a, uh, a Cleveland Indians fan and live in Boston, you can listen to all the local games here. Or if I happen to be a Boston fan and lived in Cleveland, I can listen to the local Boston games there. So it's a great way uh, to listen to your favorite hometown stations uh, remotely because there's nothing worse than those generic uh, network announcers for some of the games. You really miss your local announcers. 
I've even watched the games by turning off the, the audio and tuning in the radio to listen to a local announcer on the radio. Another option is Broadcastify, and Broadcastify has both a scanner app for your phone, uh, and they have a website, Broadcastify. And on Broadcastify, you can do a, both a paid version and a free version, and you can listen. And we have our local repeater on Broadcastify, so anyone can listen to our local repeater. Uh, so if they want to tune into our net, they just need to use Broadcastify. So if they're not in the area, they can listen to it without anything other than an internet connection. And I have information on that here on the Broadcastify audio feed and the call ingest. These are two ways that you can tie your local repeater for free into uh, Broadcastify so that people can listen to it. There's just a little diagram showing it. Uh, the, the last service I'm going to talk about, this is a commercial service. There's no amateur radio here for the most part, although there are some shortwave utilities and some uh, non broadcast stations some police departments and things like that it's called radio garden and when i worked with the sixth graders a couple weeks ago when we were doing radio day a lot of them found this really interesting and the thing is it spins around the world and it goes to your location so it zooms in on northeast ohio but i could just as easily go to boston when i go to boston i can zoom in and i can click on a station and for places like boston it gives you a list too in addition to just clicking on the dots but you can do this anywhere in the world so if you have people that want to listen to foreign languages let's go to the north of norway Oh, this is one of my favorites. This isn't working. They usually have nice Scandinavian folk music on the Vardo station. So you can do this anywhere in the world. You can tune in to stations. So we got a Bengali giant eagle ad. <laughs> So that's Radio Garden, and this is a blog post about it. A couple blog posts actually clumped together, so if you're more interested in uh, Radio Garden, you can read that. When you're looking for commercial stations, this uh, website called Radio Locator, let me kill the local repeater. This uh, website called Radio Locator lets you search for U.S. Uh, cities by zip code. You can also search by format, and you can also church, uh, do some searching for world, world radios by country. Uh, there's also the FCC broadcast AM and FM radio reports and list that you can use to find stations. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, information on shortwave listening and uh, shortwave station broadcast schedules is available at this HFCC uh, site. Uh, i got to fix that link. I got the wrong one there. I didn't fix that one. I will repair that link. I have the new one. Okay, so the other option, of course, is not just to listen, but to actually put your own radio on the on the air. And you can do this either locally, if you just want to listen to it in your house, you can use one of these little software-defined radios, or you can put it, if you have an internet connection you that you want to put it on share it, you can listen to it from anywhere that you have internet access. So again, you can start off with a very cheap, uh, under $10 dongle, or you can go with the uh, Kiwi. I think the Kiwi, if I remember right, is about... Oh, I'm trying to remember. I think it's about $80, but I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what a Kiwi cost. Oh, I didn't mention one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, these SDRs, some of them can be used also if you want to use them in addition to your radio to be able to do a band scope. So like a 7300, you can use one of these SDRs plugged into an external port. You can add to your 7300 and add a second band scope to it. You can also use these just as a general band scope with logging software or contesting software. Um, this is a website um, that has a lot of information on SDR news, the new models that are out, uh, the hacks that people have done. Uh, using Here's the lessons on using SDR in the classroom. I gotta read this one, it just came out. Actually, it just came out today. It just came out tomorrow. 
actually no it came out today so this is the kind of information that's available on that website uh, again uh, I put together this little I put together that little single triple page guide, but there's also information more detailed from the uh, web SDR group. They have a FAQ and information about the web SD project. So there's a lot of help there, both in using them as a, as a local user, but also using them if you want to install one. And the same thing with the Kiwi groups. They have information on using the Kiwi software, the Kiwi radios and also information on setting one up so they tell you how to set up the, the ip address and how to set up the radio and how to administer it and everything so that information is all available in the link here's the web sdr interface from my little handout and uh, you might want to bring this page up when we go out and experiment with some if you don't if you want to see some of these uh, things and the one from the typical web uh, kiwi web interface I have a couple of videos here. I'm not probably not going to. Let me just see which ones these are real quick. So most of the consultation that goes on takes place uh, software-wise. Uh, it's all things. And it I'll, looks like here. I'll let you watch these videos through the link anytime you'd like. I'll, I'm going to do more demonstrations, but I have some videos here that you can watch. So. I'll do some demonstrations here in a few minutes, but any questions so far? And again, here's the link. And with this new wonderful feature on um, Zoom, I now can have double screen so I can see you all on my other screen. So when I'm, when I'm looking towards the side here, I'm looking at my other screen. Uh, this is uh, WA1MAD, I have a question. Yes, Matt, Mike. Thank you. Um, I notice when I'm on, I, I use it quite a bit, and I use it for almost every application that you've mentioned in every way that you've mentioned. And um, uh, sometimes there's a limit on num the number of people that can be listening at the same time. And every once in a while, I get bounced out. Is there like a hierarchy of if you're if you've been on too long, you get bounced out, or is that something that's set by the by the station itself? It's set by the station itself, and a lot of the Kiwi operations only allow one user at a time. So uh, that's where I hit it more, much more often. On some of the web SDRs, they're supporting thousands of people at one time, and I'm not sure how they support that many people. So I don't really know behind the scenes uh, what's driving the difference, if it's computing power, if it's the uh, – I know a couple of the sites actually have multiple receivers at their site. Uh, so they're not just running one receiver. I know the, the Utah group, uh, the Northern Utah group actually has here, uh, they actually have four receivers out there. They have the yellow, green, blue, and magenta receivers that cover different bands so they can increase the numbers. And uh, they've been, they've had, they've added, I know, to their number because they used to only have one. So I don't really know the answer on that, Mike. Does anyone else know the answer to that question? Well, WA1, oh, sorry. Hey, now, but now you've raised the question, so we're going to have to look into that. Yeah. Well, uh, WA1Q, Bob uh, sent me to the Hall in Massachusetts SDR. It's not actually on the other list, and that's the same thing. You've got four stations. And what's interesting is the delay, if you're on one receiver, the delay is different than if you're on another. And if you, like when I do, um, for once in a while, I do um, net control for e-cars, and if I'm, if I'm trying to listen on that, it really gets confusing because the delay is like three seconds on one receiver and one second on another. And it depends on which, which one it bounces me to, but it can get a little bit frustrating, but that's not, that's nothing else uh, other than just operational. Thank you. And, and I know that on the, uh, on the broadcastify, there is a definite multi-second delay on our net. So if you're listening to our net on, on audacity, I mean, on broadcastify, it's, it's definitely a few seconds behind. It's very noticeable. Um, most of these, most of the ones on web SDR though are pretty real time. So I can listen to my own signal pretty well. There is a, there is a slight delay. So on the uh, web, the Kiwi SDRs, you can just type in a location. So if you want to search by state, you can see the ones that are in Ohio and the one that's closest to me is off the air right now. He's, he's, changing everything around his antenna he had some antenna issues so he's not on there but there was another one here and uh, when you click on these some occasionally you'll get a message that it's busy but sometimes it works just fine like this one's doing 
And typically, I'm going to turn the sound down a little bit here to start with. Typically, on all the different ones, the first thing you're probably going to want to do is zoom in some so that you're not seeing such a wide band. So you're so you're you're focusing on the area that you want to see uh, the most. Uh, so there's ways to zoom in. Also, make sure you're on the right mode. We're on 40 meters, so lower side band will be good. Let's go ahead and and then when you grab these little sliders, if you grab it by the edge, you're going to end up changing the filter size. So you want to make sure you grab them by the top or use your mouse to move them around. I'm sorry, or use your keyboard to move them around so you don't moving your mouse over them. Let's zoom out a little bit here. We're zoomed in a little bit too much. Okay, why am I get, not getting the zoom the way I want it? There we go. Then you can type in a frequency to start. Let's change our filter size. We don't need it quite that wide. Turn the volume back up again. Okay, we're going to abandon that one because he's not receiving very well. I'm not sure what's going on antenna-wise there. Um, let's jump into the uh, one in northern Utah. We'll use the green one here. Wait, fine tuning can be a challenge sometimes. Yeah, and what I find is the easiest thing is activate this one as long as you use the keyboard and then use your left right mouse button. It makes it a lot easier than using the mouse. Absolutely. I'm not going to hear W1AW on 20 meters here. It's too close. If it really is that there. Oh, I forgot. I'm in Utah. I can't hear it from on 20 meters from here. <laughs> That's the thing you have to remember is what, what what state or country you're in for the radio you're using. And do you think there's any advantage of the Kiwi over the Web SDR? I've used Web SDR, but uh, I don't turn my video on. I, uh, but I haven't used the Kiwi one. It, it, for for using both what's your opinion do you think one's well, better worse easier i think most of these ones on the a lot of the ones on the web sdr are, seem to be a lot more robust setups uh better antennas better setup uh, there's a lot of people who throw a kiwi up just to play with it and they have a little wire sticking out of the back of it hanging on the floor uh, laying on the floor so i know the one that i was using local to me i was hearing a lot i was i couldn't figure out why it wasn't working when i talked to the guy he said the antenna's down but he still had it up on the on the air, which was sort of weird. So, yeah, that I found that the web SDRs when I'm working with kids, I usually steer them towards the web SDRs. But the nice thing about the Kiwis is you can find so many more, so you can find a specific location you want. Yeah, 
And one of the videos in the slideshow that I have um, actually goes into the he goes through and does a mapping. Uh, he does a triangulation of stations using multiple SDRs. I got sure. my nightly dog. Yeah, based on signal on. strength, receive, you know, the received signal strength of each one, SDI. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's great. And that video is by the gentleman that does the ham radio crash course. Uh, I forget his first name, but Josh. it's in the. Yes, Josh. It's in the, uh, the videos in the handout. I like your, your comment there about the um, using the um, uh, the dongle there to use as a band for a band scope on the 7300. That's because uh, there's a lot of people using those. We have one at the club, and uh, that's that sounds like an interesting option. Yeah, and it's there's a there's a lot of kits out there to put it in there. I think DX Engineering is selling one now also. Uh, that you, for the 7300, it's got the uh, connections that you put in. I think that was who had had it, but I can't remember for sure, but I, I did see it with one of the major yep. manufacturers. I've seen it. They sell it. I, I think it's yep. in the $100 range. It's very safe because it automatically disconnects uh, when you transmit it, disconnects it from your SDR so you don't destroy your SDR. Yes, you and uh, the, uh, yeah. MFJ also has a tool out there for disconnecting your uh, remote receiver uh, similar to that that they have. So, yes, there's a number of them out there, and that is one of the problems, of course, is if you're blasting with a 1500 watts uh, locally, that's not a good idea. So one of the things, you know, one of the nice things about them is if you, if it's not too far away from you, you get the same reception you do, but you can get rid of local noise. If you have a problem with, you know, we have one member of our club who has uh, a neighbor that grows, we, we call them, they're, they're growing baby carrots in their basement. I think that's what they're growing. It's obviously got to be something healthy like baby carrots. He was using it so he could listen to another one that was across town. He was fine. He could transmit from his end, and he was able to carry on QSOs with 80 meters that he was never be able to do otherwise because he had no receive. The different types of, you know, when we, we did have a presentation, uh, you were correct, a couple of weeks ago on uh, remote operating, you know, transmitting and receiving, and that's really become a, a pretty sophisticated option now for a lot of people with with uh, uh, antenna restrictions and such. And the key to that working properly was that there had to be zero delay, you know, absolutely zero, especially if you were trying to do CW. Do you find some of these, um, is there any one type of S web SDR that has less of a delay uh, that you found? over? Because you mentioned some of them were, pr were pretty extreme. Yeah, I think it's I think it's more the luck of the internet connection between you and them. And I don't know if you'll see variation on a day to day basis. Now, if you have a bad internet connection, internet connection yourself, you're going to see that they all have a bad delay. So if you have a pretty good internet connection, I think you'll be able to find some that are pretty good. Um, speaking of remote operation, this is sort of a completely aside, but if any, I, I'm, I did the FT8, F, I think I did the FT8, FT4 program for you guys. I can't yes. remember if I did for you, but if I didn't, just remember that it's very, it's extremely easy to do remote operation with that because you don't even need to worry about listening to the audio or sending the audio across to just hook up a, uh, an app that can do remote control of your desktop and you can do that very easily. Well, just uh, since the time when I had asked you about doing this presentation and today, uh, well, we had our, we had our uh, museum ships operation last week and we gave, we've been had a few other few discussions and we were doing some FT8 there. And we now have in our possession one of the early flex radios, the FT1500, which you made a mention of, and yes. also an SDR play. Uh, so I think between the two of them, we're gonna be, we're gonna get, start to get rolling with some remote <sighs> stuff. Okay, so let's see who was work, who was on the, um, who was working the, co the call sign on Saturday. I worked uh, phone NC, CW, I worked uh, the K1 USN. Let's see, what time was it? It was uh, 20 meters at uh, 1746 on single sideband. I don't have the log right here. Rick, Rick just uh, compiled the log and sent it out to me earlier today, but uh, I haven't had a chance to look through it. I can't say, I don't think it was me because I certainly would have recognized you, but I think someone called out to me. Oh, Pat. Was Pat, Pat was on, yeah. remember? Okay, yeah. yeah. WV1D. I don't he was see doing sideband. Yeah, yeah, he was that, doing sideband then. And then I worked. Uh, I think it was uh, Watson on uh, for this single for this SST uh, the other day. That was. I think that was Rich uh, K1DJ. Okay. Uh, perhaps oh, either that or it might have been Chuck. No, because no, because I worked Rich on another. I worked Rich on by himself because Rich was my instructor for uh, CW Ops. 
That's right. He told, yeah, he did. He sent, but he sent me a thing and said that he had worked here. No, I think the uh, the operator said uh, on uh, Sunday night was <laughs> WS1L. Other questions I can answer on the uh, remote software defined re receivers. Anything else you'd like to see? Anything I'd like? I can um, demonstrate more, but it's actually more fun to play with them on your own. It is. It's a lot of fun. Um, I have the setup on my 450D, so I have full band scope and waterfall display using that MFJ device to prevent me from getting, I, I have got just the RSP1A and it works great. There's no reason, I mean, full screen, as big a, as big a screen as you want. So it's great. And also, yeah, I, have a, yeah. I, I, I do this, I have the same setup and I have, uh, uh, I bought a cheap uh, 43 inch uh, HD TV up there. That's my up, my third screen, my upper screen. Yeah. And uh, I can put my uh, my band scope up on that. And there's also um, SDR uh, Facebook groups. If you have any specific questions and you you know get into that group, you can ask the questions, and I'm sure you'll get a, an answer. Um, yeah, and uh, the for field day coming up. If you are you guys doing a in person field day this year or? Yes. Well, we are going to be there's going to be several other uh, club and we're not specifically doing one, but a lot of our members are members of other clubs and they'll be doing them. I think this is the link. Let me make sure. I think I'm pretty sure this is it. Uh, it's a good handout to have there for your students that might visit you. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, I I'm wondering where. You might suggest uh, a person go who has no familiarity whatsoever with uh, the concept of SDR. I was, uh, uh, to be perfectly open with this, I'm, uh, I've been in ham for 65 plus years and uh, I, I'm a, a really old fashioned ham. I do mostly uh, the original digital mode CW. And uh, I was talking to a fellow the other day and told him he should, I, I also have a IC7300 by the way, uh, which is one of my favorite radios sitting in my TV room all by itself. It's not in my real radio dungeon, but um, I was talking to a fellow who uh, I, I had suggested to him, hey, go listen to this. You'll probably learn something good about SDR. And he had what I considered some gross misconceptions about SDR. And he has a very small footprint ham shack and thought he had to have, you know, an immense amount of uh, personal computer uh, desktop uh, footprint in there. And I said, no, it's, it's, it's not that at all. So if, if you knew a person, to give you an example, who... Uh, to, between the IC7300 and the Yesu FT950, I'll use as an example, and the difference between them and why one is SDR and the other is not, and why SDR and how it works, uh, where, where would you send a person to learn the basics of that and how software in a radio like the IC7300 uh, replaces the, uh, if you will, the, the more fossil technology in an FD950. Yes, uh, there, there was a good, pre there was a couple good presentations at the QSO Today group that was uh, this spring. Uh, one was by ICOM. They did one of the presentations and uh, that link is at QSO, QSO Today Expo. Uh, they have all the videos from last year. Um, that was one of them. And then another one was at the, um, i trying to remember what other session I heard at this at. I can't remember where it was at, but there, there was a couple talks by some of the ICOM people uh, at these. There was also a very good talk at the Four Days in May group, the QRP group in Dayton. And they, their, their presentations are available online now. It was from uh, the gentleman in India he was talking about the whole concept of putting together an SDR radio um, and integrating the different components. Uh, you know, it was a sort of a do your own. It was it was a, a, a basic, you know, I'm going to build this radio up 
from the ground up. So it was a very good discussion as far as the theoretical aspects of it go. But um, I'd say that those would be probably the two best places to look. So again, it's four days in May, FDIM. Um, and I'll, I'll send the, the link to Pi because um, I have his email here. I'll send the link to that. And then the other one I think was was by ICOM and it was at the QSO Today Expo. I'm pretty sure that's where it was at. I'll double check to make sure. But that's uh, two of the sources I would say are good. Now, the thing is, a lot of this whole idea of whether you call radio SDR or not has to do with the way you want to advertise the radio. So these commercial radios like the 7300 call themselves SDRs, uh, but there is some conventional components in it. So it's not strictly an SDR. And then radios, then people like the Elcraft will say, well, of course, the Elcraft KX3 is an SDR, just has all the controls on the front of it, but you could operate it as an SDR with IQ uh, input going into an SDR software. And let me bring this up. I didn't mention this part too. On my website, kzt.com, I have a link under, you see in the screen right now? Yeah. Okay. So under the tech, uh, there's one here that says uh, SDR remotes and online radios. All these links in the far left, uh, a lot of these are software that runs the uh, rate, the software defined radio. So if you want to experiment with them, these are all software where you can feed the uh, the hardware into it and they'll do the software processing. So like HDSR is a very popular generic one that a lot of people use with uh, hardware that they put together. So these are all uh, information on that and you can go out and you can download this software and you can experiment with it, but they also have information on how the software works and the type of hardware that it'll work with. So in this case, you can use any of these types of hardware with their software and put those two together. So there's a lot of stuff out there as far as experimenting goes on this site. So again, it's k8zt.com SDR, and I'll put that in the uh, chat. All right, outstanding, thank you. I I, I felt uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, an RF, in, in my prior life, an RF engineer, and when I left engineering, I was writing software and I was starting to explain a couple of people how you, how you can write some software that'll model and make anything you, you want to look like, look like that and then make it a radio. And I realized I was uh, uh, losing them real quick. And uh, so I, I think it's, uh, that's, it's, that's valuable info. Well, this uh, is the four days in May presentation. And let me see if I, if they, I think they have them posted now. I'm assuming they do. Maybe they don't have them posted yet, the videos. I don't see the... Okay, all they have is the prizes here. <laughs> That's good. Let me try something else here. Well, I, I appreciate your input and great presentation, by the way. There is a really good presentation that Far, uh, Far, Farron or Far, did at Four Days of May that was very interesting. Here we go. So this is part one, but I think we need part two. So let me take a quick look here. Well, this is another good person to listen to because this is the guy that did QCX. Although he's not uh, talking about that here. He's talking about a completely different thing, but this is the one. Okay. Okay, this is the one that you need to listen to. So it starts... Okay, I'm going to put this link in the uh, chat. You might have to go back a little bit, but that's that's uh, Ashar Farahan, VE2, uh, VU2ESE, 
He does a great job talking about how he puts together this whole concept of building the hardware and designing the software. And he does a good job of explaining how they work together. Wow. Wow. Outstanding. Then I think, let me check here, QR, QSO Today Expo. Uh, these are the, it's March 31st. And it is well, they're not all showing here. There's a number one by Flex Radio where I'm guessing they will explain SDRs, but there was one by ICOM that I was trying to find here. Again, I'll put this link for these in the this, and you can search through these. Yeah, good. Yeah, all right. I don't, I don't, I don't want to keep you. Oh, no Thanks. problem. Yeah. This is what I this is what I did back in the days when I worked when I was training teachers on using technology in the classroom. I provided resources. Yeah, well. <laughs> my partner and I were constantly we we supported thirty schools, so we were always providing resources because we, wow. we didn't have time to ch chat with them individually all the time. Yeah. Well, this is a good resource. Thanks for your time and your effort. And well, listen, I got I to I gotta give a shout out to Anthony's website and tell you, when you talk about resources, his is second, his website, the k8zt.com website is second to none as far as information. Ham radio, yes, but also a lot of generalized educational tools that, that are phenomenal. I, gave him, I have a daughter-in-law that's a teacher. She's, she's using it all the time now, Anthony. Oh, very good. So this is what... Uh, Actually, I have two websites, but they tie together. So the kzt.com, um, if you look up here in the corner, there's a section for students and teachers that takes you to uh, ham radio resources, but it also takes you to the kids radio site, which is on my other website, the ZT Learn. And in here I have content for all the different subject areas in school. This, is, this was my work uh, resource when I was still working. Um, so I put in the uh, chat a little earlier the link to this handout right here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me put it in there again. That's nice because it. I'll bring it up here on the screen. It has. Um, the software defined radios on it for one thing but this is nice because you can print these out and put them on your table at uh, field day or anytime you're doing a public service event and that you don't have to have one for everyone just laminate them and they can shoot the qr codes with their phone for any of the links that they want so here's the information on the on the web sdrs on that little handout that i put together this free frx and they can just shoot the qr code and it'll give them that information wow Nice. Again, that link is tiny.cchry. And I'll put that in the chat again. Okay. Anything else I can, any other questions I can attempt to answer? Anthony, I have a question. It's Rick NYDC. Yes. Yes, go ahead, Rick. Um, thinking about the situation, particularly on 160 meters, I'm a little bit intrigued with the possibility, to whether it's legal or not in a contest, I'm not sure. But I know my signal gets out very well with an inverted L, but I can't receive very well. If I could tap into an SDR somewhere that's got beverage antennas on 160, I could potentially turn my station into a super station. But I don't know if that's allowed in the rules of CQ-160, for example, or ARRL-160. Well, the CQ-160 allows you to have have external remote receivers that are, let me bring up the rules here because I have them handy. Let me get that link. I know one of them just eased the rules quite a bit on the remote receiver. Okay, remote operation, use of any receiver. Uh, it says it's strictly prohibited. Well, remote operation for unassisted entries 
is permitted under the following conditions. Use of any radio receiver located away from the main site is strictly prohibited. Use of a separate receiver at a remote site is prohibited. If the remote station is okay. I don't know what the distance is, but there's a distance that you can have for the remote receiver. I don't know if it's 5,000 yards, five, 1,000 yards like field day is, or if it's further. I thought one of these two groups just increased the distance a lot for the, and I don't remember if it was the AWRL. Now, when you go to a K3LR station, which isn't that far from me, they have one wall that all that it has is Pegasus SDR receivers on it for all their band, uh, for all their RBNs, for the reverse beacon networks. They're running in a separate one on each band. Now, they're right there at their location. Um, I don't know on the rules on that. You're going to have to check but the, to see what the rules are as far as 160 remote receiver yeah, I'll take a look. It seems like it would be a totally unfair advantage. Well, you know, even if you can put it, I'm not sure how big your property is, but if you can get within the the size limit of I mean, the distance limit at another person's house and put another antenna up that's far enough away that you're not interfering with it constantly. Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, on 160, I can hear pretty good. I mean, well enough that I've got, I don't know, like 75 countries verified. But I've listened to what a beverage antenna sounds like at VY2ZM up in PEI. Yeah. And it is, it's an order of magnitude times 10 better than what I can hear. And so I, I'm, I'm just curious. It just seems like it'd be a cool way just to listen in anyway, just to see what it's like. Yeah. Well, you know, I always feel, you guys always make me feel bad when you're working all those 160 stations during the contest that I can't hear. And I wish I was in New England with a receiver at those times. That's why all those guys want the receive the transceivers in Maine for the remote operation between 160 and six meters. You guys drive me crazy, but, uh, well, thanks we had a good, the feedback. Man, we, had, we, we, we had a good week. We had a good week last week. I got uh, at actually was, I think it was Saturday. I got two new countries on six. I got uh, Aruba and uh, PJ four on six, uh, here and i i've been doing a lot of it as i mentioned when i did my ft8 ft4 talk i did a lot of my original reason i got an ft8 was to increase my 160 numbers and i am now uh over 70 i think i'm at 70 something now for my dxcc on on uh 160. so i think there's i think that you know you were talking about two different types of rules of when you were talking when rick was talking about in a contest using a remote receiver i think there are still some uh yeah. some rule restrictions but i it may be that in the assisted category uh they may be broader i'm not sure i know that uh, but as far as dxing is concerned i think now you go to the the rules that say that with your you know you can operate anywhere is within the united states let's say you were trying to uh work a lot of pacific's uh dxcc stations if you move to California, now all of a sudden you'd have a chance to uh, to do that. Well, operating remotely, I think it's still it's still um, uh, totally ex uh, acceptable. Now carry that into the thing where you've got a DX pileup going on. You're transmitting the signal. Rick's transmitting his signal, and he knows he could be heard, but he could be listening if he's listening on VY2 ZM's uh, beverage antennas. He's going to be able to hear that guy calling him back where maybe maybe at his house he's not is that legal we, we don't know but uh to be able to you, and you could have multiple people using a remote beverage setup because uh, i know they do it on the d expeditions all the time yeah interesting uh situation i'm going to do some research anthony thank you very much for the presentation it was very good one of the distinctions too is is you i know this is a lot you can set up the remote receiver and send spots to yourself not listen on it but you could have it collecting spots for you and posting them across the internet to you that's allowed uh in the assisted category because you're not listening to your own signal you're only collecting spots and then sending the spots to yourself so you're not using the secondary receiver to receive the other stations that's talking to you but you are gathering spots with it remotely so that's another thing too if you're working in an unassisted category you can you can do that and i've actually done that when i've been working in an unassisted category i've ran another antenna on the property here where I've been feeding into CW Skimmer the whole time during the contest, sort of like a reverse beacon network locally uh, to do it that way. So I'm not hearing the stations. I'm just having the feeds come in from another computer to my computer.
when I'm watching the packet cluster and I see uh, spots on W3 LPL especially, but probably also K3 LR, and I'll see and, and it, a, a spot will come in and it will say uh, it's hearing such and such a station in it's hearing it at a, re, it, at a, at a receiver site that's in Massachusetts and maybe another one in, in Ohio. Now, we know where they're located, but what is this now? They're feeding, they have separate re, uh, remote receivers that they're feeding back into uh, W3LPL? Yeah, some of the people are doing that. They're, 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 what they're doing is they're aggregating multiple receivers into their, 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 their reverse beacon network feed so that they're getting spots from multiple locations. Now, you can do that, of course, by just using any DX cluster and just opening it up so you get all the spots from everywhere, which is kind of useless because the spots that they're doing in Kazakhstan don't help me unless they're spotting me in Kazakhstan, which they aren't. Um, but yeah, they, they do that so they can get directional feet, so they can get an idea of directionality. Uh, because what some of these big stations do is they choose which height of antenna they want to use based on where the signals are coming, how the signals are coming in at different locations. By the way, this has nothing to do with SDR, SDRs, but I'm not sure if any of you attended Contest University. There was an absolutely groundbreaking, fabulous talk by Charlie One, Charlie Tango One Bravo Oscar Hotel. He talked about the whole idea of one-way propagation and of, uh, I, I can't remember the exact term he used, but, but windows of propagation, where the MFU um, ionization level is only a specific region. And if you're not passing through that region, even though you might have a very good MU, MUF at the time, you're not going to get the same kind of propagation. Again, that's at Contest University, and it's CT1BOH. His talk was just unbelievable. It, it was a, he used over a billion contacts from um, spots with uh, FT8 and FT4, and then analyzed them against uh, different MUF databases uh, to do real-time propagation uh, enhancement and he was draw, he was able to draw diagrams to show you if you were 10 degrees off to one side you weren't going to get propagation but if you were 15 degrees the other direction you were going to get great propagation so you know the whole thing so that kind of answers that thing about the mystery of why can't this guy hear me you know because he's yep. s9 here why isn't he hearing me and uh, that's that's kind of the answer right there yeah it, and i i know i have his um I have the slideshow here, and they, they, they have the videos online now, but uh, if you go to, I'll put the link in here for the Contest University. And I, they did a nice job because it was remote this year. They had, they featured three of the people they featured were um, from outside the U.S. that they would not normally have as speakers here, and he was one of them that did a really good job. But there's the link for Contest University, and it's Charlie Tango 1 Bravo Oscar Hotel Jose. And it was called, uh, there's, nothing, there's Nothing Magic About Propagation. Of course, of course uh, uh, yeah, I think we've all experienced spotlight propagation, which is even more amazing to me sometimes on some of the bands where there's, just, um, there's almost like just a very small geographic area where people from one part of the world are working in another part of the world and you're going, wait, what's going on? Is, is somebody, somebody kidding me here? His, his uh, idea for using this information, the first people he wants to start using are these de-expeditions so, so that they'll try and work areas of the world that they're going to be able to work at specific times. He said there's some s windows that are so small that if they don't work at that very specific time, they're going to miss that opening completely, whereas the, another, another opening may be open 23 out of 24 hours to them. I think that's where the whole uh, de-ex, uh, de-expedition pilot uh, thing has really has really shown that that's that's a, a need that you know they've been doing that as they as they get information from people but now you're talking about it being even more sophisticated yeah so i'm hoping that bove does that so i can get them when they're down there because the chances of me working bove will be minimum anyway so after our remote operation uh production last weekend you know he was give, he one of the things he did he gave a demonstration of working using the uh one of the stations the super stations up there in maine and uh you know i think he's i think he has like a paid subscription to that particular one to be able to make use of it mm -hmm. i'm i'm envisioning fast forwarding to uh, what's it going to be january of uh, 2023 when they're when this uh D, the bouvet that's going to be the big one that's going to take place then well you're going to have people lined up probably willing to pay anything 
for a five minute window operating from one of those super stations to be able to get in line to work the Bouvet station. And I, I just can't, you know, I mean, how, it's going to present a whole new set of problems. For, it's almost going to be like, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the, the whole uh, uh, peak uh, pricing that they use for, for Uber, when, <laughs> for you Uber. Have, when you have 50,000 people coming out of a stadium and there's only five cars. That's okay. I'm going to work them from my location here. My wife told me a couple years ago, I, there was a person, uh, this is actually, this is quite a while ago, in the single sideband uh, uh, CQ Worldwide, there was a person in Ohio that would always beat me because he'd work from the Finley Radio Club and he had nine towers. And my, my, I told my wife, I said, the only reason why he's beating me is he has more towers than me. And she said, is this score nine times higher than yours? And I said, no. Then she said, you can't have more towers then. But I wouldn't be able to put any more on my property anyway. I, I don't have a very large lot here. I'm just got it squeezed in. The only spot I can put a tower. <laughs> I just sent a, the last link I just sent out is to all my presentations. My newest one I just rolled out last week. It was amateur radio and trains. And uh, it includes a, one trip to New England and visiting a number of places, including uh, Steamtown and uh, the main two footers and my trip on Amtrak out the glacier and a number of other locations that I've traveled. So I remember Marty up. asking you about the train, uh, a train yes. presentation. So it's, maybe it, uh, it's have ready you now. Have you premiered it yet? Or can, yes, can I we, did we, it last. I did it last Thursday for the Virginia beach group. And my wife actually even joined me and co-presented it because she was on all the trips with me. So it covers our trip on Amtrak to glacier, our trip to, uh, to Maine, our trip to, um, Orlando Hamcation, and we stopped at a train place. Uh, our operation for field day from uh, West Virginia, Cass Scenic Railroad. By the way, I'll be uh, to Bravo and to Bravo, West Virginia for field day. We're driving about two hours of the Panhandle. We're not going anywhere exciting, just over the line, because there's not many operators in West Virginia for the field day. So I'll be operating this hand on FT8 and this hand on CW and phone. Well, listen. You let let me know what your uh, what your um, schedule is uh, going forward here, because I think we'd like to get uh, uh, we'd like to get you in line for that uh, that new uh, train and ham radio presentation you have. Okay, and the slideshow is in the link there um, with the uh, tiny dot Actually, I'll just put the ham. I'll put the link directly to the that presentation. It is A R trains, or as one person told me, Art Rain. If you change the way that you gotcha, yeah. divide the letters up. And maybe I can even convince my wife to help co-present again. Well, you tell me when it's a convenient time for you. We just, we do it, uh, you know, like you, like, you know, every other Tuesday. So we have plenty of open spots ahead. By the way, I found, I bumped into a, a group that I did a presentation for. I'm not sure if any of you have heard them. They're always looking for people to join them. The uh, Vienna Wireless Society, who was the winners of the Dayton Amateur Radio Club of the Year this year, does a Monday night uh, wacky digital net where they do a Zoom meeting plus on the air meeting and they try out digital modes on the fly and they try and stump each other with digital modes that they transmit. So it's the uh, Vienna Amateur Radio, Vienna, let's see, Vienna Amateur Radio, no. It's AWS, what would that be? Amateur Wireless Society. Wireless. Yeah. But they do a Monday evening group meetup called the Wacky Digital Net. It's very do, interesting. Do you have a link on that one? I'd like to look at that anyway. Let me see if I can find it real quick yeah. here. Uh, let's see. Don is the person that does it. Don Taylor. Okay, here we go. Any relation yes. to, Joe, to Joe Taylor? No. No, he's not. Okay. I don't have a link here, but if you... If you send a, I'm going to put his, I'll send, give you his email here. You can email him and ask him about, tell him I told you about the net, the, the Monday night digital net. It's Don Taylor. And I just put his email in there. Dio, Don Tay, 155.
Anything else I can do for you this evening before we? Anybody else have anything here for uh, for Anthony? Yeah, let's get the trade one scheduled soon because I'm looking at your presentation, Anthony, and it looks pretty good. Good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, he's got it now. His wife is uh, is going to be traveling. Yeah, and, she's and, in the uh, pictures uh, there. I, I yes. she, she's going to be traveling, so we, we have to kind of work. If he's going to get her involved in this, we got to we got to. He's got to schedule that with her first. Well, what would work? You know, if if you were doing in person meetings, but I could ever do it the week she's in Boston, but I'm not sure when that is yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, were you on the Down Easter up in Maine? Is that the one? No, you took I, I from just Boston up? I just I I did not I did not do that. Uh, I've never done that trip. I'd like to do that trip. We, our our trip to Maine was we went up to um, um, we up I operated from uh, Arcadia on Cadillac Mountain. I operated field day. Oh, nice. And what we did is on the way up there, we stopped in Vermont at Sherbourne Village. So we visited our first train of the trip up there. Just They just had the engine and the, the depot there. And then we stopped at the main two-footer museum in Portland. And then we went up to Cadillac Mountain. We went up and operated. I operated from Cadillac Mountain for field day. And then after we were done, we went down to Newington and operated W1, W1AW. And then we went over to Scranton, Pennsylvania and went to Steamtown and then home for that trip. Oh, nice. That was a yeah, My was wife a and I did, did the York. We went to England uh, one year and we went to Yorkshire. Oh, and you, then we went to the big train museum over there. That's Justin. in there. That's in there, too, because I went to Scotland, and then traveled around on Britwell. So that's in there. The York Museum is part of this presentation. Oh, You're great. giving away the secrets here. <laughs> I think that's the picture no, I, I saw. I didn't know I went, that. Oh, my God. <laughs> it sounds like that existed. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Museum. National Railway Museum. That's going to be it. Yeah, that was that was very good. So we we, we Anthony, did that. I, Anthony, I'll shoot you some dates, and you can okay. and you can tell me you can tell us when you can. Uh, when can you, you can just do it now? Just kidding, just kidding. No, I want to I want to be able to spread the word about it. I had yeah. it. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was okay. it, my my wife and I had a great time putting it together because we, we dug back through our our uh, our photographic albums for the older pictures most of the, i had a lot of them on the computer but i had to scan some from some albums for for like our trip to england we didn't have them on the computer so it was fun to dig back through that and get some memories and you get to see a very slim uh non-gray haired me and oh, my yeah. wife looks very different in the pictures too but you gotta remember that's 40 years ago we all came in uh, in in uh, other versions i'm not 40 years i'm sorry 30 years yeah. 30 years ago 35 years ago i think that was that was 1991 when we were in England and Scotland. So yes, planning, different version. Are you planning to go to Maine again? I, I'd love to. We, we probably will. Um, we we tend the, the the goal we do on field day is we choose a, a state that has under 20 entries. Uh, so and the the other rule is it has to be a two letter abbreviation because I won't go to any of those stupid three letter sections that are confusing the send on CW. Like EMA, yeah, yeah. 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 So. Um, we we tend to hit uh, Maine, Vermont, Delaware, West Virginia are our biggie places to go to. Uh, I'd like to go back out to Montana again, operate from Glacier again. That was fun. Uh, well, don't forget, I think I invited you the last time. My buddy is working on the uh, steam locomotive in Ellsworth, which is just before Bar Harbor, and they've got it all apart and they've got to replace. They're rebuilding it. It's a ten-year project. It's going to be about a million and a half bucks, and. Uh, He's uh, there's some videos I have standing next to the wheels, which are six feet big. It's the 470, which stopped running in the 50s from Boston, and they took it out of Waterville in a trailer, believe it or not. Uh, three pieces, they took it. So it's really worth going up there and seeing this thing pulled apart in pieces. Well, the last training thing I'll leave you with is if, you, if any of you are heading out to Ohio, ever the uh Cuyahoga valley scenic railroad the railroad that i work on we have our steam in september and we uh, have it but uh all year round we run a wednesday through uh sunday schedule multiple trips in the Cuyahoga valley national park it's a 54 mile round trip and if you come early in the morning you can actually run ride both rides for this one price so you can ride 108 miles of uh, trains during one day and if you let me know ahead of time i'll try and be a trainman in your car and drive you crazy with trivia questions while you're there have you done the Cog Railway? Have you gone up the Cog? I, I, we, we visited it. We had a very limited time, but we did visit and 
poked around for about an hour, but we didn't have time to take the cog up. So there's pictures of the cog in there too. I forgot to mention that. Yep. You know, as we start putting this, as we start putting this together, we kept thinking of, oh, I missed that train. I missed this train. I missed that train, and we had to keep adding things. I didn't even touch uh, a couple of chips. There's uh, East Broadtop in Pennsylvania in there, and there's a bunch of different things. So. Anthony, where, you're, um, where are you in location to, let's just say, uh, if you drew a line between Cleveland and uh, Dayton, where, where are you as far as that? I'm 30 miles south of Cleveland. 30 Here, miles south get... of Cleveland? Yes. Okay, so, so just bear me out on this. We go, we, we go to uh, Dayton every year, and one of the things that we would do, we, 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 hit, we hit Cleveland usually on uh, uh, Wednesday night. And yep. then we, we, on Thursday, we drive down to, well, we, we normally, we've been, we'll make a stop at either like uh, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is a great take in, done it many, a number of times. The one year we drove to the Football Hall of Fame, but I wonder if it would be on Thursday, I wonder if it'd be something that uh, we could kind of uh, make something happen, you know. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me show yeah. you on the map here. So if you look on the map, this is where I'm located right here where this little green, uh, tree is at where it says Silver Springs. This is Cleveland. This is where the railroad's at right here. So it's bet it's right between Ak the, it actually starts in a Cleveland suburb and goes to Ak downtown Akron is where it, where it ends. So it's right there along the uh, and actually my previous job that I worked at I was just right by the Hall of Fame football Hall of Fame down in Canton. I used to drive down there every day. But the park is the Cuyahoga Valley National Park is where the railroad's at, and it's between Cleveland and Akron. So it sounds like there's two runs every day on this. On Saturdays and Sundays, there's two runs. I'll put the link in the. Uh, it's. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat here. I was thinking to only specifically of like a Thursday because that would. That's kind of like the day that we uh, are heading between Cleveland and and Dayton, and you know. Yeah, there, there, there's the link. Uh, it's www.cvsr, Cuyahoga Valley Scenic Railroad. I don't know why we don't have two R's in there, but we have just uh, one. And uh, they run they run a wide variety of things. We run, the, the regular runs are called the Scenic, and that's just the regular trip. But on Friday evenings, um, they run a dinner train with these fancy cars and the dome cars and all this. And they do all sorts of things. But they run uh, Sundays through uh I'm sorry, Wednesday through Sunday with two rides on Saturday and two rides on Sunday. And I think there's two rides on Friday, too, once they get started back up. You can also bring a bicycle aboard and they have um, they let people ride the train one way and then bicycle back. You can also do the same thing with a kayak in the Cuyahoga River. Um, someone asked me this weekend if we had horse aboard. We don't have horse. You cannot bring your horse on the train and then get off. You generate enough horsepower as it is there. Yeah. But it's we uh, in a typical year when they have a non pandemic year, we average about 220,000 rides riders per year. We do 40 plus thousand just for the holiday train in November and December with the kids. Well, we've got some we got have some food for thought here to uh, uh, but but I will I'm going to send you a, 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 a some proposed dates to see if there's anything that would fit into you, uh, your schedule, because we'd love to, okay. we'd love to, we'd love to do this. I got to tell you the, uh, you mentioned about the radio garden. Uh, and I know that wasn't specifically a ham radio thing. I use that every day. And, and I had gotten that a heads up on that uh, a while back and tried telling everybody else here about it, but, uh, I listen to it all the time and, and you find something new. I didn't know about the blog. So I'm going to check that out. Yeah, it's not a blog from it. It's just a blog talking about it. So right, just a couple right, interviews, yeah. but, but it's interesting. But, you know, the, the, when I did the, what I do with uh, fifth and sixth graders and sometimes seventh graders, I do this, we, I do something called Radio Day and I work it out with the teachers and we have the whole class together and I do a presentation, just an introduction. And then during the day, each of the classes is based on radio. So we'll do wavelength versus frequency for math. We'll do... Uh, um, uh, phonetic alphabet and Q symbols for language arts. We'll do, uh, for phys ed, we'll do jump rope uh, wavelength and frequency. And we do classes all day, but then we also have the kids doing projects. So we'll, we'll have them doing the SDRs and things like that. And 
couldn't do it this year because of the pandemic, but one of the teachers that I do it with regularly said, let's try and do it virtually. So we did it uh, the last week of school, which was the first, last week in May for them. And I had uh, 51 kids we did and they uh, they enjoyed it very much. But they when they were listening on the SDRs, they found a, um, I think it was in Wisconsin or Illinois, I can't remember, they found a police dispatch radio on, on Soundgarden and they just thought that was the most hilarious thing to listen to these stupid police calls it wasn't like your murders and things like that it was like the you know the cat in the tree and the uh mayberry like, rfd yeah, f- yeah four to man you know actually it was a, i guess it's four to woman now that rex bar naked but uh <laughs> they were they were just laughing because they had never listened to police radio before most of these kids when i asked them i said have you ever tuned a radio and they look at me like, what do you mean tuner radio? I put my my playlist on. They never in read. So I, Soundgarden was fine for them, but I also wanted them to tune the SDR so they actually had to tune the frequency and, and get an idea of how frequency worked, how you could change stations. You know, as you gave the demonstration there and you said how, you know, the people, let's say from Ellicraft will, will tell you that a KX3 is an SDR. I think it when you were giving a demonstration there on the web SDR, which which someone could do with maybe one of these thirty dollar dongles, and then you could also listen to those same frequencies with a KX three. Um, to me, being a ham and you being used to just turning a dial and everything else, it's it's so much easier to do it. So in other words, the SDR uh, little dongle works works great someone that doesn't have any skills of tuning a knob like I do would probably catch it pretty fast and learn exactly like what you were saying they're using the left and right uh, you know on your keyboard or whatever to be able to tune things in so uh, it's a it's a matter of perspective from from uh, which way you're coming at it so tell your daughter that we need to do radio day with her class so <laughs> we're, we're talk, you're talking great granddaughter right now yeah great I'm sorry great granddaughter okay Anybody else have anything for Anthony here? This is great. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad you were able to spend some extra time here. Just to thank you. Thank, okay. Thanks again, Anthony. You, you, you do a great presentation. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate okay. It. Well, it's been fun being with you guys. I get to have, a, I have a whole bunch of clubs I belong to virtually now. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're, we'll rem- you're a member here. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. 73.